<laughs> all right, <laughs> we'll see. All right, let's see. Uh, uh, here's where we are. Uh, the story so far, uh, neural networks we saw are universal approximators. They can model pretty much any function. But in order to model a given function, we must train them to model the function. And the way we do it uh, is we try to uh, learn their parameters such that a loss function that we've defined that characterizes the gap between what the network actually computes and you, what, the, what you want the network to compute is minimized. And this function is an ugly function, so we use gradient descent to perform this minimization. And the gradient required to perform gradient descent is computed using backpropagation. So here was the uh, setup. We define a loss function, which defines, which computes the average divergence over your entire training set. Given the training data, the loss function is a function of only the parameters of the network. And this is what we must minimize with respect to its arguments, which are the parameters of the network. The gradient descent algorithm for this is to first initialize all of these parameters and then iteratively take steps backwards against the gradient of this loss. And the gradient of the loss is the average of the gradients of the divergences for the individual training instances. And the gradients for the uh, divergences of the individual training instances must be computed using backdrop. So uh, here was a brief pseudocode for, in order to learn the model parameters, we would first, first initialize all of them. Then we iteratively uh, take steps and in each iteration you're updating the parameters. For each update, we first go through all of our training instances. Each of the training instances is put forward through the network so that you compute all the intermediate values and the final output of the network from which you can compute the divergence. And then you perform a backwards propagation, a backprop to compute the derivative of this divergence with respect to all network parameters. And then finally, so this requires, this is the great backprop portion of the uh, update. And the actual update is for the actual gradient descent is this final step, which uses this gradient to update the parameters. So we'll begin with a poll because and just to, you know, so you guys, I'm playing psychological games. So just so that, you know, you think there are only poll, four poll questions, poll, the first poll is numbered poll zero. Wait, can you not find 437? Nope. It's published. Can any? Yeah, yeah, it's published on Piazza. Sure. Hmm. All right, 10 seconds, guys. You can't find the poll? All right, so that must just make sure the rest of the polls are up, right? Some of you can see it. So this is kind of odd. Anyway. This is. All right. So uh, does anybody want to answer this question? Let me start with Pragya. Can you answer the question? Option A. Option A, right? So everyone with me so far. Now let's move on. Backpropagation based gradient descent is used to learn network parameters. Will this always give you the required updates? Will it actually give you the required solution for your, uh, that you're looking for, the solution that you would actually want the model to learn? Let's take a look. Is backprop always right? And then here again, I'm not speaking of a situation where backprop may or may not, uh, uh, may or may not find the optimum of the, the optimum, 
I'm assuming backprop actually finds the optimum. When backprop does find the optimum, is it right, right? So in other words, the question is, does gradient descent find the correct solution even, if, even when it finds the actual minimum of the loss? So we're trying to, to answer this, let's go back and look at this, uh, this uh, picture again. We remember you saw this a few lectures ago. Now, if you were computing the total error on your training data, then you would actually be using a threshold activation. And at each point, you would be computing for each training instance, you would be determining if the training instance is correctly classified or not. And that total error is what you would be trying to minimize, right? But this, minimizing this total error is not actually going to, or what would the problem be, Adnan? Uh, we're trying to minimize the total error when defined in the manner that we have on top, where we're just counting whether each training instance is correctly classified by the current net network or not. Um, so, because it's a threshold thing, you don't know exactly where in the threshold is driving or not driving the current inside. Is it just about where, where it is, or is there something better than that? There's something more than that, right? So, uh, Shani, can you tell me? Why wouldn't that thing work? Can you tell me? Because you don't know if by changing it a small amount, you don't know how, um, if it's working or not, how right or wrong you are. So the thing is here, if I perturb my network a little bit, the output will not change until the perturbation is large enough for a new instance to be correctly classified or misclassified. So you have no idea of whether the perturbations are in the correct direction or not. And that was why we changed to the second kind of function, which was smooth, but where you were counting not just whether it was right or wrong, but the gap between what the network computed and what you wanted it to compute. And this actually does give you an indication of how far you are. So here, for example, the total distance is larger than in this case. So clearly, if you move the threshold from the point where the function moved from you know, across the 0.5 value, if you shifted that from T1 to T2, you seem to be going in the correct direction, right? But will this give you the same solution as this one, assuming that you actually could scan the whole space in the first case? So is the second one going to give you the same solution as the first one? Aditi, can you tell me? Is that really what is happening? Jessica, can you take a guess? It should. So tell me what would happen if I had a situation of this kind where I had a very large Remember, you're computing the total distance, right? Suppose I had a very large number of instances out here, like tending towards infinity, right? Each of them has an incremental distance from the line. How much influence will they have on the overall function? They're just going to push the function out left because they want to reduce the gap for each one individually, right? This is regardless of the few functions, points you have in the middle, whether they are correctly classified or not. The ones to the far right are going to overwhelm the error and they're going to give you, they're going to push the function in the wrong direction, right? This, so the thing with the nice one on top is that once you're past the threshold, things are either right or wrong. But because you're computing the distance, having a very large number out here means that the cumulative distance of this guy, these guys, is going to be so large that it makes sense for the function to be pushed left, 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 until this distance becomes as close to zero as possible, right? Which ignores the real data out in the middle. Is it making sense to everybody, right? So this is not going to give you the solution you're looking for necessarily. It's a proxy for the function that you're trying to minimize, but there's no guarantee that minimizing this proxy will minimize the function, which is the error that you actually want to minimize, right? Yes. But conversely, the negative examples would push it to the right. Uh, if, I had a, if I had a balancing number out on the left, right? So, but the point is you're very much dependent on what you've got, what you're looking at. 
So in classification problems, the classification error is a non-differentiable function of the weights. The divergence is only minimized using a proxy, but minimizing the divergence may not minimize classification error. So to give you a better picture, this one is from a very nice paper by, by Brady, Ragman, and Sloney back in 1989. Suppose I have a training. Let's compare the perceptron rule with back propagation using the softmax, the logistic uh, loss function, right? the logistic uh, activation function for a simple linear classifier. So if I have training data of this kind, will the perceptron rule find me the cor a correct solution? Because it's yeah. linearly separable. If I were to use the logistic function, and if I were to use gradient descent, would that find the correct solution? It's nice and you know all the classes are nice and far away, right? It should. Because, but now, suppose I add a little dot down there, one training instance. Would the perceptron rule find the correct classifier? It should, it's guaranteed, right? The classes are linearly separable. You should always find it. But then, in this case, both the both back prop and the perceptron rule will find more or less the same solution, right? In this case, what would happen? Because you have a because you have a predominance of these other dots, right? Those are going to dominate the loss. So the actual solution you will get is going to be somewhat more like this. If you have, unless you let the uh, unless you uh, let your network weights grow in an unbounded fashion, if you have any kind of bound, the actual solution is going to be off because this one point is not going to over, you know, overcome the total evidence of everything else. Now suppose I move that other stuff spoiler to this case here, this position. Backprop, uh, the perceptron rule is still going to find a classifier. But the solution found by backprop is only going to be perturbed by a tiny amount, right? If I move it out there, the perceptron rule will find me my classifier. Backdrop is going to find, is actually going to give me a classifier which is going to make a mistake on that instance. Is this a bug or a feature? Why is this a feature? So what is happening is this one, per the perceptron rule has, <clears throat> very low bias. What we mean is that it's always going to find the correct solution. The backprop based solution is biased. It may miss the correct solution, but on the other hand, the backprop based solution has low variance. It's not going to change a whole lot just because you changed one instance. Whereas the perceptron rule can just go from flying all over the place just because you changed one training instance, right? So you see the distinction of what's happening. And having a low variance, is gives you a, a more stable model, which in some sense we like to believe is better, right? Yeah. How would changing one point in that prop uh, change the whole thing? Uh, because uh, in this case, if you see, a majority of the points are. So the back prop is shown by the solid line, the dotted line is a perceptron rule, yeah. right? So it will. So if you add one more point to the left, it's still going to give you, give you the same output. So the total loss has changed, right? So the solution will change. Okay, but it will still misclassify those two points. Uh, I mean, if you add one more point on the uh, fourth, fourth quarter, third quarter, it will still give you those two misclassifications. If you add one more per point, add one, uh, if you keep adding points to the third third quadrant, eventually the those, you know, it's about the loss, right? The cumulative loss. So. The perceptron rule may change greatly by adding just a single new instance, but it's always going to fit the training data well. So the perceptron rule has low bias. It makes no errors if it's possible to make no errors, but has high variance. Just by moving one point, I can make the solution swing from one position to the other. The backprop based solution is minimally changed by adding just one new training point, right? So it prefers consistency over perfection. It has bias because of this characteristic, but it has low variance. 
Now, this is not just restricted to single perceptrons. If I have a network, a network captures curved boundaries, arbitrarily shaped boundaries. So if I have training data of this kind, a network might, cap might capture this curved red boundary. Now, if I had one more training instance out there, this is what they call the spoiler in the paper. This one spoiler is not going to change my function entirely. It's probably going to be perturbed just a little bit, but it's going to actually misclassify that instance because the framework prefers consistency over accuracy. Right? Questions? No. And so, Backpropagation will often not find a separating solution, even though the solution is within the class of functions that can be represented by the network. So in these examples, when I was looking at the simple perceptron, the perceptron, even with a softmax output, can find the correct boundary, but backprop will not do so. So backprop can often not, will often not find a separating solution, even though the solution is within the class of functions learning by the, learnable by the network, because the separating solution is not a feasible optimum for the loss function. One resulting benefit is that a backprop trained neural network classifier has lower variance than an optimal classifier for the training data. You don't actually always want to be optimal for the training data. You want to have something that makes sense. And so this is probably going to give you something that makes a lot more sense. As a poll. Let's try if this one works. That's why the first one was poll zero. It was a trial. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. It's an easy one. Okay, someone on Zoom, can you give me the answer? I'm assuming there are people on Zoom. False, okay. And I think it's popped up. This is false, right? Obviously. Now, uh, so minimizing the differentiable loss function is not ne like necessarily going to minimize the classification error. This is false, right? Now, the other thing, in, in the uh, explanation that we just looked at, we assume that you're actually finding the minimum of the loss function. And uh, it's just that finding the minimum of, of the loss function as we defined it may not minimize classification error. But then, uh, loss functions are not like that, right? Loss functions can be hideous. So a typical loss function might have various little dips, lots of local minima, the network is complicated, the divergence function is complicated, a complicated function of a complicated, very complicated function is going to be complex as well. So uh, what kind of loss surface do we have and how does that influence minimization? There are, people have studied these things and they continue to study this, these things at, on end. There are various hypotheses. So here are some popular hypotheses. In uh, very large networks, saddle points, which are regions of this kind where when you come along one direction, it's a minimum, but along the other direction, it might even be a maximum. Uh, those are far more common than local minima. And another hypothesis is that although there are many local minima, they are all equivalent, meaning the loss value at all of these local minima are more, is more or less the same, which means finding any one of these is going to give you an equivalent solution. For small networks, this is not, okay, not, not true. And saddle points in particular seem to be a specific, uh, particular uh, challenge. This is a point where the solution is, the slope is zero, but the surface increases in some directions and decreases in the other direction. So some of the eigenvalues of the Hessian at that point are positive and the other eigenvalues are negative. And some can even get the zero. And so gradient descent algorithms, which are looking for zero slope, when they arrive at these places, they can get stuck, although they're not a good place to be stuck in. 
So the story so far, neural nets can be trained via gradient descent that minimize the loss function. Backprop can be used to derive the derivatives of the loss. Backprop is not guaranteed. Actually, gradient descent using derivatives computed using backprop is not guaranteed to find a true solution even if it exists and lies within the capacity of the network to model. That's because the optimum of the loss function may not be the true solution you're looking for. For large functions, the loss function may have a large number of unpleasant saddle points or local minima where you might get stuck with backprop. So not only will does, uh, are you not guaranteed what you're looking for if backprop does indeed find the global minimum, there's a pretty good chance that it won't find the global minimum in the first place. So all of this, we assume that training arrives at the local minimum or wherever the derivative is zero. But does it always get there? Does gradient descent always get there? And how fast does it get there? Let's look at this. It's hard to analyze for an MLP because it's a very complicated function. But then we can take at the, uh, look, at the, look at the problem through the lens of convex optimization because, uh, uh, yes. Uh, is the saddle point issue comes up more frequently when you end up learning at the saddle point in practice to people ever take the Hessian set in the training? You have a million uh, you know, parameter network. I'm not going to be computing Hessians anytime soon, right? So there are other kinds of heuristics we will use. Anyway, so the reason we're going to be looking at convex functions is because of the streetlight effect. I'm sure all of you have seen this joke about the guy who lost, lost his keys in a bar and went and looked for them under the streetlight because, you know, what's the point? It's dark in the bar anyway. You might as well look where you can see things. So this happens all the time in math. You're trying to solve some problem, you solve something else because that's what you can solve. Yes? I have a question there. So, can we say that if we can simply um, refactor that uh, the neural network can solve, uh, can find also solutions that uh, uh, perceptually can find? The, you're increasing the capacity of the network. Yeah. So, you're disting you must distinguish between what the network can model and what gradient descent will find. And increasing the size of the model means that you probably have, you are increasing the capacity of the network so the network can model your function better. But that doesn't mean Backprop is going to find that solution. But uh, if we increase uh, the number of parameters that the previous slide says, uh, we can find a global minimum? No, increasing the parameters doesn't, increasing the parameters just made the function uglier. So, in, So this is a, oh, this one, this is just a hypothesis about the loss function, right? So it doesn't mean that there are no local minima. It just, that's, it just says that when you have a very large network, the majority of regions where the derivative is zero are saddle points. You're still going to have lots and lots of local minima. So in the case that the, uh, our property optimization algorithm is converting this to a local minimum, that means say that Most likely, most likely, right? It can get stuck in saddle points, that happens too. And so now let's go back and look at convex functions and convex surfaces. What does anybody remember what a convex function is? Anyone? At least one of you must know what a convex function is. No? Okay, anyone on Zoom? So a convex function, a surface is convex if it's continuously curving upwards, period. But this, this literally means that if I take any two points on the surface and I draw a line between them, that's always going to be either on the surface or above the surface. So this surface is convex, this surface is convex. This guy is not convex, right? Because I'm drawing a point line between two points above the surface and it's actually, the line is actually going below the surface at some point. Note that there's a nice clear global minimum in all of these cases. It has nothing to do with minima. It has to do with the, this behavior. That if I draw a line between any two points on the surface or above the surface, the line must always be above it, okay? You can also define convex sets. Here's a convex set. A convex set is typically a level set of, or a sub-level set of a con convex function. Yes. Yeah. No, sorry. So in a convex set, the de definition is that if I take any two points within the set 
and draw a line between the two, it's going to stay within the set. So this set is convex, this set is not convex, right? So we're gonna be analyzing convex functions over convex sets. And even if you have a very ugly loss function, if I look locally at within, within bowls, it looks kind of convex. So it's a reasonable, uh, hypo a reasonable place to start from. Now, we have an iterative solution which is incrementally taking steps in some direction. This iterative solution is going to try to arrive at the global optimum. So these pictures show level sets of a loss function. The darkest region is where the, the minimum lies. So if your iterative solution does something of this kind where as you approach the minimum, it, the steps get smaller and then finally you get to the minimum and you stop, it is converging, right? On the other hand, if something like this happens where you sort of come there and then you keep dancing around, then it's jittering, it's not really converged, but then you can have something worse. You can begin arriving at the solution, but instead of arriving each time, you try to go towards it, you overshoot, and then you get further and further away. So what are the situations for this to happen and not this? To understand, let's take a look at the best, nicest possible uh, convex function, a quadratic function. Quadratic functions are very nice. Of all, of all possible convex functions, quadratic functions have this nice property that the slope, the derivative is just linear. And so you can, you sort of arrive smoothly at the optimum if you're doing any kind of iterative solution. But then let's see how, so uh, most, and this is what uh, even the most, the oldest optimization algorithms like Newton's method were designed for because these, these functions are so nice. So these form quadratic functions are kind of the gold standard for a convex function. And pretty much all measures of quant convexity refer to the quadratic function in some manner. Now, a quadratic function has this structure. And I just have the half in front of the first constant, just as a matter of convenience for, for you know, just so that when I differentiate it, the two goes away, right? So half a w squared plus b w plus c. And now, we all, all of you have learned in school how to try to find the minimum of a quadratic function. Anyone remember? What was the solution? Okay. <laughs> That's, all right. We can do the derivative. It, yeah, correct. Okay. So anyway, uh, so 2a, because there's a half, that just becomes a. But anyway, you can also, you can get the solution in a single step. Let's say you can solve for it. I can just take the derivative of this guy, equate it to zero. That is going to give me a linear solution, the equation, and I can always solve for the zero of a linear equation. That's why quadratics are so nice. It's a one-step optimization. But I can also solve for them using gradient descent. I can stop, start at an initial estimate, and then I can take steps against the derivative, right? Now, assuming that the step size is fixed, and if I start off at, at an initial point, what is the optimal step size for me to get to the solution fastest? If I want to get to the solution fastest, how many steps should I take? One, right? I just want to get there in one step, I'm done. Is there a formula for this optimal step size? So that's my rule. Let's work it out. First, how many of you have heard of Taylor's expand, Taylor expansions? How many of you have not heard of Taylor expansions? Right, and why are the rest of you not raising your hands? I expect a response, guys. I need to know either way, right? So now in any function, if the function is continuous and, uh, and uh, uh, has all of its derivatives, then if I have a function, I can compute all of its derivatives, the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on, at any point, right? Now at this point, I have f of x, and I can also define some other function, f prime of x, okay, let me call this g of x, such that f of x equals g of x at this point. That doesn't mean f of x equals g of x everywhere, right? But then I can define f of this new function such that this function and this function not only have the same value, but they also have the same first derivative at this point. So in that case, 
g of x is simply going to be, so let, let's call this x0. g of fx is simply going to be f of x0 plus x minus x0 times f prime of x0. And you can, you can verify that this, both of these functions have the same value at x0 because x minus x0 becomes 0 at x equals x0, right? So at x0, both of them have the same value. And now if I take the derivative of f of x and this one, this term will go away, right? This x minus x0 will go away. All you will be left with is f prime of x0. And so both of them have the same first derivative. I can keep expanding it. I can define f of x and g of x. I can define g of x so that it has the same first, second, you know, first and second derivatives at x0. And that's going to give me this, so can someone who remembers Taylor expansions tell me that the formula for that? It's going to be f of x0 plus x minus x0 times f prime of x0 plus what is the third term? It's going to be half of x minus x0 squared times the f double prime of x0, right? And then if you compare this function with this guy, you will find that the value is the same at x0, the first derivative is the same as x at x0, and the second derivative is also the same at x0, right? So that's going to say that you have a function which has the same value, it has the same slope, it has the same curvature at that point. And I can keep increasing the order. I can, I can add a third term, I can add a fourth term, which is one over six x minus x zero cubed, the, you know, the third derivative of x zero and so on. You can, keep, you can keep increasing the order of the expansion. And as you keep increasing the order of this approximation, more and more derivatives of the approximation and the original function match at x zero. So this is how we define Taylor expansions, right? Now, if my function is a quadratic, what is the third derivative of a quadratic? Zero, everywhere, correct? So in other words, if I just came up with this expansion and stopped at the second derivative, so if this is all I had, this approximation is, this approximation is no longer an approximation, it's exactly the function that I want because it's going to be, it's a quadratic. And if I have two quadratics which have the same value slope and, and second derivative at any point, they have the same value and slope and second derivative everywhere, right? So if I do this, I can start off at, F, at whatever my initial estimate. So let's say I have a current estimate WK, right? Then I can have a second order Taylor approximation of E. And that's going to be E of WK which is the equivalent of fx0, e prime times w minus wk plus e double prime, half of e double prime times w minus wk whole square, right? And this term is exactly the same as the first, as these two equations are exactly the same. Everybody with me, right? Now the second equation is also a quadratic, right? I can actually solve for the, is there an eraser? Yeah. I can solve for the minimum. And so when I solve for the minimum of the second equation, here's what I'm going to get. I have E equals E of W, I'll just use zero rather than K, plus E prime of W zero times W minus W zero plus half of E double prime of W zero times W minus W zero squared, right? Suppose I want to solve for the minimum of this function. How would I go about doing it? Take a derivative and what is the derivative going to be? Just work on it, work it out. The derivative will be, the first term is a constant, it doesn't have a derivative, right? The second term, this W minus W zero is going to go away, which is going to be left with E prime of W zero, right? And what happens to the second term? 
you get the derivative of w minus w0 squared, which is two times w minus w0. The two and the half will cancel, right? You're going to get plus E double prime of W0 times W minus W0, correct? And this you're going to equate to zero. Everyone with me, right? What does that give me? I'm going to get E prime minus of E prime of W0 equals divided by E double prime of W0 equals W minus W0, right? And I can just take the W0 minus W0 to the other side, and you're going to get this solution over here. The location of W where this thing is minimum is WK, as I've written, minus E prime divided by E double, e double prime, right? So now, if you compare this equation over here, it's giving you the solution in one step, right? It's a closed form solution. But if you compare this with this update rule, what can you tell me about the optimal step size? What can you tell me about the optimal step size, Ashir? Yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm? I'm not sure. Proportional? It's just going to, if, a, if I replace eta with E double prime inverse, I get this step in one solution, solution in one step, correct? So what is the optimal step size at any point? The second der inverse of the second derivative at that point. Making sense, right? And so if I take a step which is, you know, the derivative times the inverse of the second derivative at that point, you're going to get that in a single step. And if you look at this, you will also see why the second derivative has to be uh, negative. If the second, if second derivative was, has to be positive. Because if the second derivative were negative, the sign would become plus here. That's actually, you know, that's actually a maximization rather than minimization. Anyways, so your optimal step size over here is the second inverse of the second derivative. So if I have my quadratic function as half of a w squared plus b w plus c, the optimal step size is going to be, what's it going to be? What is the second derivative of e at any point? It's the first derivative is just going to be a times w, correct? Plus b. The second derivative is just a, right? The inverse of the second derivative is just a inverse. Uh, the, the, uh, so, the optimal step size is just going to be A inverse. So what do we have here? If I have a quadratic function of this kind, and I start off from some point, and I take, a, and I use the gradient descent rule. So when I, when I have a function of this kind, it's quadratic, I start here, I use the gradient descent rule, W becomes, W0 minus eta times E prime of W0, right? If the, or if eta is the inverse of the second derivative, you're going to get there in a single step, right? If my step size is less than the inverse of the second derivative, what will happen? Where will I go? Will I get to all the way to the minimum? Where will I go? somewhere before the minimum, right? And so is this getting there? So then in that case, you're going to end up doing something like this, right? If my step size is greater than the inverse of the second derivative, what will happen? Overshoot. So I'm going to end up here. And the next time I'm gonna end up here, right? And the next time I'm gonna end up here and I'm going to sort of swing back and forth. Is there a step size where I will never get to the minimum at all? What is it? Hmm? Yes. So if it's so large that you end up on like up. Uh, and how large must that be? Um, Remember, I'm, this is a symmetric function, right? I'm getting here when the step size is the inverse of the second derivative, right? So if I have twice, it's going to be here and then it's going to keep bouncing back and forth. And if it's more than twice, you're right. I'm gonna take off, right? 
And so that's basically what you will find that for the step size, if the step size is greater than twice the optimal step size, instead of converging, it's going to diverge, right? This is even for a quadratic function. Now, that's easy. I just find the second derivative. I make sure that I'm within the optimal step size. That's not a problem for me, right? The real problem arises when uh, I have multi-dimensional function. Yeah, can okay? Can you mute yourself on Zooms, guys? So okay. Now, what happens if the function is not quadratic? Then typically, then what you can do is that you can approximate the function with a second order quadratic function using Taylor series. And for each one of those, you can find an optimal solution. So the first one of approximation is going to take you there. So that gives you the new uh, location. Then from there, you can put in a, you can approximate it again with a quadratic, get to the solution in a single step and so on. But all of these, uh, this is Newton's method, but this still works only if the uh, step size you take is the optimal step size or at least less than twice the optimal step size, right? Now, if I have multivariate inputs, so W now is a vector, right? If W is a vector, then your quadratic is going to look like this, half of W transpose AW plus W transpose B plus C. So what this is, is you're going to have a bowl, but it's going to be a bowl in two dimensions. It's a three-dimensional picture, it's a two bowl in two dimensions. And now this is a quadratic. What this means is that if I slice the bowl along any axis, the slice, the edge is going to look like a perfect quadratic, right? And so if this A is a diagonal function, now if, I'm, if I've got my axes like so, then your bowl is going to be, it's not going to be the same curvature in every direction, right? I can have like an ellipti ellipti elliptical bowl. I can align the bowl to the axes, I can also have that bowl you know, at an angle to the axis, but that's the same as simply rotating my space. So to understand what's going on, we can sort of just consider the case where the bowl is aligned to the axis. If the bowl is aligned to the axis, that is the equivalent of saying that A is a diagonal matrix. And then if you write it out, what you will really find is, you know, it's easy enough to work it out. You're going to find I'm just working with this toy example just as, just as an illustration, right? If A is a diagonal matrix, I'm gonna get A1, 0, 0, A2. If I have a two-dimensional problem, W1, W2, W1, W2, this is, and there's a half, right? This is half of A transpose. Am I using the variable W there? So that's W transpose AW, plus the second term is going to be uh, some W1, W2 times B1, B2, right? Plus C. So if you look at this, this is simply going to be A times W1 squared, A1 times W1 squared plus A2 times W2 squared because the cross terms, the W1, W2 terms don't exist because the matrix is diagonal, right? So I can simply write that mate function as half of summation over all of the components, summation AI, I, WI squared, plus BI, WI, plus constant, right? So this is like saying that if this, this is what you get, when I have a bowl that's aligned with the axes, it's basically the sum of the quadratics along each of the axes, right? Now, let me plot this function. If I plot this function, if I plot the level sets, this is what the function is going to look like. Every level set is an ellipsoid, ellipse, and all of the ellipses are aligned with the axes. The minimum is some right up there, right? Now, if I take any vertical slice, all the vertical slices, regardless of well, where I, which slice I take, are all going to be quadratics, and they're all going to be the same quadratic with different shifts. And the, the shift is because uh, basically, the actual height is the contribution of the second quadratic. Remember, we are summing two quadratics, right? So at each position, you're gonna get a different quadratic. Similarly, if I take horizontal slices at different locations, they're all going to be the same quadratic, right? And 
the minimum of all of these quadratics is going to be at the same place. The minimum of all of these quadratics is also going to be in the same location. So the minimum is going to be, in this case, out here. In this case, it's going to be out here, right? So you can just individually minimize the quadratics in each direction, and you're going to get the global minimum. Everyone with me, right? Now let's try to solve this using gradient descent. So the thing is, the quadratic along the x direction has this form, half of a11 times w1 squared plus you know whatever. The quadratic along the second dimension has half of a22 plus w2 squared plus whatever. What is the optimal step size for the first quadratic? A11 inverse, right? What about the second quadratic? Inverse of a22. Now let's look at what happens. So when I use conventional gradient descent, the uh, update rules look like so. Uh, you're going to update the vector in this manner, which means you're using the same step size in every direction. Correct? So you're going to have the same update rule for every component. Unfortunately, the optimal step size is different for different components. So how does this affect us? Let's say I have my ellipse, right, of this kind. And let's say in the vertical direction, the optimal step size is one, and in the horizontal direction, the optimal step size is 0.33. Now, obviously, the shallower the function is, the larger the optimal step size is going to be, right? Uh, so in this case, let's say I take a step, uh, uh, so my eta, the step size parameter over here, let's take this, actually, let me draw this, right? So if I have, remember, if I go, if I take a step size that's more than twice the optimal step size, I'm going to diverge, right, in any direction. Now suppose I have my loss function of this kind, and you're out here, then the optimal step size over here is going to take you directly to this point along the x-axis, right? The optimal step size over here along the y-axis is going to be is going to take you here. Now suppose I take an optimal step size which is which, which is appropriate for the vertical component. What's going to happen in the horizontal component? I'm going to go out here. Right? Whereas if I take a, an optimal step size for the horizontal component, what happens in the vertical component? I'm going to become really slow at converging, getting to the optimal point. So here is what would happen. So let's say the op st optimal step size for the first component is one, for the second component is 0.33. Over here, the step size I'm taking is 2.1 times the optimal step size for, for a y, for, for x, but exactly equal to the optimal step size for y. What happens? I'm getting to the correct location in one step, the correct y location in one step, and afterwards, subsequent iterations are going to keep, you know, keep me at the correct. Uh, I'm going to get to the correct x location in one step, uh, and afterwards, subsequent uh, iterations are going to keep me in the right place. But in the other direction, I'm going to diverge. Right now, on the other hand, if I have an step size which is exactly equals to twice the optimal step size for eta two, then it's less than the optimal step size for, uh, you know, so in that case, you're going to sort of come here, you're going to slowly converge along the vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction, you're gonna keep bouncing back and forth, right? Now, if I, have an, if I have a step size which is 1.5 times the optimal step size for the second direction, then I'm going to bounce around, but I'm not going to overshoot. But then it becomes really slow in the vertical direction. And so you're going to convert slowly in the vertical direction, but you're going to keep bouncing around in the horizontal direction. <laughs> if it's exactly equal to the optimal step size in the horizontal direction, uh, then you're going to get to the optimal position in the horizontal direction in a single step. 
but then you're going to converge very slowly in the vertical direction, right? And, and if it's lesser than the optimal step size for even this guy, then you're going to converge slowly in every direction. So what is the problem over here? The issue is that the optimal step sizes in the different directions can be very different. And you want a step size that's smaller than the optimal step size, twice the optimal step size, for the lowest optimal, the optimal step size, right? But that can be too slow in other directions. So as a result, you want the learning rate must be lower than twice the smallest optimal learning rate for any component, but this can make convergence very, very slow. And so, uh, and in directions where the step size lies between the optimal step size and twice the optimal step size, it's going to kind of oscillate to a solution. So for generic, this is for quadratics. Now for you have, if you have a generic multidimensional function, convex function, then typically what we will do is to sort of approximate it with a quadratic at each point, and then solve for the uh, optimum of that quadratic and then approximate the solution, the function again as a quadratic of the new solution and keep iterating. That's Newton's method. In every case, you're going to end up with this problem, right? And so what we have is that convergence behavior, and this was at only two dimensions. As I increase the number of dimensions, it's really hard for you to find out. Computing the second derivatives is painful, right? And it's really hard for you to find out if the learning rate that you currently have is appropriate for all dimensions. Now, the problem also is that if you find a learning rate that's appropriate for all dimensions, then it's probably gonna be very slow. In many dimensions, you're not going to converge too fast. So this has to do with the fact that the curvatures along different directions is different. What is the optimal situation? The optimal situation is if the optimal step size is the same for every direction, right? What kind of an ellip, what kind of a bowl would that be? Pardon me? It'd be a, it, would, it would be a perfect bowl. The cross sections would all be circles, right? If the cross sections are ellipses, then the different directions have different curvatures. And so that means you want the ratio of the optimal step size which is the curvature, the, the largest optimal step size and the smallest optimal step size to be as close to one as possible. If it's one, then you can, you can get to the solution in a single step. If it's very distant from one, then you're going to have either divergence or you're going to have problems converging, right? So this is uh, what is called the condition number, the ratio of the largest optimal step size to the smallest optimal step size. You want the condition number to be as close to one as possible. If it's not, then you have a problem, right? Now, there's a bunch of hidden slides which discuss how we can work your way around this. But then if you have a problem of this kind, what is the basic root of the problem here? Why do we have this problem happening? Yeah? Yeah. So you want to maintain an optimal step size for a different step size for each in each Element. each direction, right? So um, I have this very nice situation over here where the ellipses are aligned to the axes. When they are not aligned, that that will cause problems. Take a look at the slides, right? So so, and I'm getting to the solution to that. So how would you fix this problem? Tanay, can you take a guess? Yeah. So Shani, can you take a guess? Okay, so I've got one of you. Let me find one of you guys, Ivan. I stick a gun to your head and I ask you to fix this problem. Here's my gun, right? How do you solve it? Can someone do it without a gun? Yes. You can try to scale. Perfect, right? If I scaled the axes, the vertical axes, now this picture is gonna become a circle, right? It's a one-step thing, a single scaling, and then problem solved. 
So Newton's method actually does this. In multi-dimensions, that's the inverse, the equivalent of multiplying the space by the inverse of the Hessian matrix. That's what the, the, the uh, uh, inverse of the second derivative does. It makes the curvature identity, right? And so if you multiply by the inverse of the Hessian matrix, then the curvature is gonna be identity in every direction. You can get to the optimum in a single step. Unfortunately, this will require computation of Hessians and inversion of Hessians, and that's not something you want to do when you have a million parameter or a billion parameter network. And so we need a different solution, right? So if I were to take a, a second order approximation to any function, then there's gonna be a Hessian and the optimal step size is going to be inversely proportional to the, uh, to the uh, it's, it's going to be proportional to the inverse of the Hessian, so which is going to be painful. Now, much of the analysis we saw was just based on trying to ensure that the step size was not so large as to cause divergence within a convex region, right? But is this even a problem? For a that for a model such as like a neural network, the actual loss function looks something like this. It's really hideous. So given this, uh, it's not convex, right? Now suppose you start off at this point and always made sure that you had an optimal step size. Would you find the local minimum? You're gonna get stuck and you're not gonna find the global minimum. You're gonna get stuck at the closest local minimum. So if you were started off over here, having to put, having too large a step size be a bad thing you're going to step out, right? And so it's not even clear that, you know, controlling our step size is a good thing. Always having you, in, if you are in the wrong place, you want, to, your step, you want your step size to be greater than twice the optimal step size. On the other hand, if you're in the correct bowl, do you want the step size to be greater than twice the optimal step size? You're going to bounce out, right? So then given these two criteria, how would you fix it? You can start with a large learning rate, greater than twice, you know, two times the optimal step size, assuming normalization greater than two, and then gradually reduce it with iterations. And the expectation is that in the beginning, the step size is so large that you're going to bounce out of whatever local minimum you are in. But then the assumption also is that the optimal, global optima, or things that are reasonably close to global optima will be in large bowls, not in narrow things, uh, narrow valleys. And so eventually you're going to end up with a step size that is smaller than twice the optimal step size. And when you do that, you're probably in a large bowl and a large bowl probably has the kind of minima that you like. And so that's based, so, yeah. But is that a good assumption? Like the fact that we have to live with something. So we assume this and that's how it works, right? You don't know what the function looks like. And so this is what we typically do. We're going to DKR learning schedules. The step size is the same as your learning rate in your homework, right? You start off with a large learning rate, and then with the iterations, through the iterations, you keep decreasing it. And the hope is that if it's large enough, initially you jump out of ugly local minima, but then eventually it becomes small enough that you actually find, uh, end up in a bowl and find the local appropriate local minimum. So uh, how do you decay these schedules? There are a couple of different techniques that we've seen. You can decay it linearly, where you start off and you know just keep dividing by the iteration number. You can decay it quadratically, you can decay it exponentially. There are reasons why some of these are better than others. We'll get, we'll get to that in a couple of classes. And so the common approach for neural networks it's, at least is to train, you know, uh, instead of just trying to decay the step at each time, we might do something else that you might start off with a large learning rate and when you start off with a large learning rate, you're going to sort of end up in a place where uh, that's, uh, you found some local minimum which is appropriate for that learning rate. And then you keep decreasing. And then you change the uh, learning rate and decrease it and repeat the process. So the idea is that you expect to have bumps within bumps within bumps, and this will find the solution for you. Anyway, the story so far, Gradient descent can miss obvious answers. This may be a good thing. We have all kinds of convergence issues. The lost surface might have many saddle points, although perhaps not uh, so many bad local minima. 
and gradient descent can stagnate on the stab saddle points. Vanilla gradient descent may not converge or may converge too slowly. So the optimum, because the optimal learning rate for one component may be too high or too low for other components. And so, yeah. Wow, I'm only at pole two. This one's easy, so 15 more seconds. All right, so does anyone on Zoom want to take this question, take the question? Anyone on Zoom? Option one, step sizes that are greater than twice the inverse of the second derivative can cause it to great diverge. Uh, anyone here want to take a? a. Only A? So what were we talking about over here? Is that always a bad thing? Nope. Okay, so what about B? This is, the B is false and Will it not converge without decaying learning rates? It can for the case of the quadratic. So only A is right, okay? So decaying learning rates may not be a bad thing, particularly for ugly loss functions. They provide a good compromise between escaping local, local minima and convergence. But all of these still tie back to the fact that we are trying to have the same learning rate for every component as Chanwu just pointed out. And so we can try to uh, so the problems arise because of requiring a fixed step size across all dimensions because the step size is tied, step is tied to the gradient. Let's try releasing that requirement. And there are a great many algorithms that have been proposed in this process. And again, if you want to do it formally, then you want to, because the directions may be coupled, you have issues. Nonetheless, we will ignore it. And so here are some algorithms, R prop and quick prop, that actually try to uh, release this requirement. And how do they work? R prop is the so called resilient propagation algorithm. It's a simple algorithm that is followed independently for every component. All it does is to check at each time am I going in the correct direction? If I'm going in the correct direction, I'm going to increase my step. If I have overshot, I'm going to go back and then I'm going to decrease my step. So, the, so let's say. I have a function of this kind, and this is my current estimate. And the current derivative is negative, which is what this, this negative, or negative pointing arrow shows. Then I know I must take a step forward, right? So I take a step forward. Now I check the derivative again. The derivative is still negative, which means that I have gone in the correct direction, right? So should I continue in the same direction? And would it make sense to increase my step size? Right, so you now take a step which is some alpha times the previous step, which is larger than the previous step. Then you check your derivative again. And then you say, I'm still going in the right direction because the sign of the derivative is still the same, right? Then you increase the previous step size again by a factor alpha, which is alpha squared of the first step size. Eventually you get to a point where you have overshot. Now, if you check the sign of the derivative, the sign of the derivative would have changed with respect to the derivative in the previous step. So now what, what is the same, what, what, what must you do? You have to go back first, right? Because you overshot. And then decrease the step size by some factor of beta, right? And then repeat the whole process. It's a very simple trivial algorithm. And you do this individually for every component. And uh, this algorithm, I just have the pseudocode for it. Typically you have a ceiling and floor on the step. So this is not the step size. This is not the learning rate, this is the step. What you're doing over here is that you're not using the value of the derivative itself, you're only using the sign of the derivative. And you're saying, is the derivative, is the derivative telling me to move forward or back? If it's telling me to move forward, I'm just going to take a step forward. 
then if I'm going in the correct direction, I'm going to take a larger step forward and keep doing this, right? And this technique, and eventually you can end up with a very large step or a very tiny step, so you have floors and ceilings. Those, those are just heuristics. And it turns out that this is a remarkably simple first order algorithm that is frequently much more efficient than gradient descent. I'm always surprised that we don't see enough people using our prop because you know, the, the code is, the, the intuition is so simple and it works. It only makes minimal assumptions about the loss function as you're not assuming anything about the convexity of the loss function. And uh, most times it works. So here's your third poll. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. <laughs> Okay. It's asking how, uh, how do eigenvalues gain and determine whether one is increasing or decreasing? They're talking about the Hessian eigenvalues. So the Hessian eigenvalues, the eigenvalue of the Hessian basically gives you the curvature. It's the second derivative. And so uh, if, my, my, if my curvature is, if my second derivative is positive, is that a minimum or a maximum? It's a minimum. You're not supposed to answer, right? But one of the rest of you, if the second derivative is, a po is positive, is it a minimum or maximum? Eugene. And if, it's, if the second derivative is negative, it's a maximum, right? So the Hessian, at, when you look at a quadratic function, then there are two axes in the space, right? Ellipses have two, a major axis and a minor axis. So if you walk along the major axis, you could either have a function of this kind or a function of this kind. So also along the minor axis, you could either have a function of this kind or a function of this kind, right? And so a saddle point is one where it's a maximum along one direction and a minimum along the other. So the second derivative is going to be, one of them is going to be positive, the other is going to be negative. If you want a peak, then all the second derivatives must be, regardless of the direction, must be negative. So the signs of the eigenvalues of the Hessian function, the, the Hessian tell you how the function behaves along the various major axes. If one of the, if I have a two dimensional variable, uh, if I have a function of two variables, the Hessian is going to be two cross two. If I have one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue, it tells me that along one direction, it's a maximum, along the other direction, it's a minimum. So that's how it works. Anyway, what was the answer here? Oh, damn, I gave you the answer. <laughs> Don't look at the answer. What was the answer here? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's another algorithm called QuickProp, which was invented by our own Scott Feldman. Uh, it turns out a lot of this work was actually done way back in CMU. So see, this is where much of the work on neural networks happened back in the 90s and the 80s. Hinton was here until 95. And uh, he had PhD students in CMU until the 2000s. And when I was in grad school, it wasn't the in thing to work with Hinton for whatever reason. Uh, so neural networks didn't really take off till 2010. And quick prop is another variant. I, I urge you to take a look at the slides where you actually try to guess instead of explicitly trying to compute second derivatives, which can be very expensive. You try to compute, guess this as how the loss changes across iterations and use that in the optimization and it's very, and gives you, it gives you a remarkably effective optimizer. So to add to our conclusions, adaptive or decaying learning rates can improve convergence, but we also saw that methods that decouple the dimensions can improve convergence. But then, uh, so with dimension independent, uh, learning rates, the solution will converge smoothly in some directions, but oscillate in others. The proposal is let's keep track of the oscillations, right? So let's make it dimension dependent. 
The point is, if I want to compute the optimal learning rate for every direction, I need to compute second derivatives. This is going to be a painful process, right? And the, again, we don't really know if that's the best thing to be doing, as we saw. So here's what we will do. I know that if I'm converging in some direction, I'm sort of going slowly, smoothly towards it, right? On the other hand, if I'm not converging, what is it I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be oscillating, right? And this can be done, I can, I can determine whether I'm oscillating or converging simply by looking at the value of the solution itself. Over here, if I look at the vertical y component, the y component is monotonically changing. The x component keeps bouncing around some center, right? So let's track the oscillations. And in directions where I'm having smooth convergence, I can actually sort of emphasize the step, the learning rate. In directions where I'm bouncing around, I'm probably taking steps that are too large, so I can reduce the step size. So this is the same, this is basically going back to the issue of having a step, uh, steps that are dependent, independent, so different for each of the directions, but then we need a mechanism for deciding what these steps must be, and this can be determined based on the behavior of the loss itself. So here's what I can do. These, these give, give, lead us to the momentum methods. So here's what you will do. I'm going to maintain a running average of all of the steps. Remember, I don't even have to look at the loss. I just have to look at what the parameter value is. And if I'm made maintaining a running average in direction where the convergence is smooth, the average is going to have a large value, right? In directions where, the, where I'm bouncing around, the positive oscillations are going to cancel out the negative oscillations. And so the average will have a small value. So I can just look at the average of the steps in each direction, the running average, and that will give me an idea of whether I should take a large step in that direction or a small step in that direction. So that's what momentum methods will do. So there's the plain, the, the simple momentum update. Now in your plain gradient descent, at each point you're just looking at the gradient and you're saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a step against the gradient. And the problem with that is, you know, if you have uh, a function of this kind, again, remember that the gradient is always orthogonal to the level set. So at this point, so if I have a function of this kind with level sets of this kind, then at this point, the gradient is going to be in this direction. And so the step is going to be in this direction, which is not in the direction that I really want to be walking around, right? And so that'll take me out here, then this is going to take me out here, and so this is how you would converge if you're walking against the gradient, because the gradient is always orthogonal to the level set. Whereas the step you want to take is not necessarily orthogonal to the level set, right? So what the momentum method does is that it looks at the derivatives in each direction, and then it just maintains a running average of the derivatives in each, each direction. So let's say, um, and how does one compute running averages? James, do you remember? You don't, okay, does anybody remember? What I would do is I say I have a current value. So suppose I give you a sequence of numbers coming in and I ask you to compute the mean of the sequence. What would you do? When you've seen only one, in, one value, that is the mean itself. When I've seen two, it's going to be the average of the two, right? If I've seen three, it's going to be the average of the three. three. But then when I get, you know, I, I don't want to be redoing the computing all over again. So what I can do is to say, I'm going to maintain in one variable, I'm running out of time, so I may go over a couple of minutes, just bear with me. So the average is going to be summation i equals one to n over n, right? This is the average after seeing n instances. But this is the same as saying summation i equals one to n minus one xi. And if I divide this by one over n minus one, then this is n over n minus one plus one over n xn. Do you agree with this? Right? 
So this is the sum of the first n minus one terms. Uh, sorry, this should have been n minus one over n, right? These n minus ones will cancel out. So this is one over n of the summation of the first n minus one terms. And this is the one over n of the uh, summation of the first, the nth term. But this is simply going to be x n minus one bar, right? And so I'm going to get n minus one over n times x n minus one bar plus one over n x n, which is generically, generically of the form alpha times x n minus one bar plus one minus alpha times x n. So that's how you compute running averages. Every time you something comes in, you just take a convex combination of the previous ab running average and the current instance. So we literally just maintain a running average of the derivatives. Actually, we maintain a running average of the step sizes because all which, which is against the derivative, right? The negative of the derivative. So at the kth step, the running average is going to be beta times the running previous running average minus one minus beta times the current estimate, but you also factor in the step size, the actual step size that you want to use, eta, right? So this is going to be your running average of the derivative. And then you just update the parameter using the running average itself. Make sense, right? So how does that work? With the running average, the steps get longer in directions where the gradient retains the same sign, but where the gradient, the derivative keeps flipping back and forth, the oscillations are going to cancel out. And so, uh, I have a pseudocode, I'll skip the pseudocode, take a look. So over here, if you were just doing regular gradient descent, this is how the updates would proceed. But if you were using momentum, then in the horizontal direction, the running averages are consistent. So the steps will get slightly longer. In the vertical direction, the positive and the negative swings will cancel out, right? And so the average derivative gets smaller. And so as a result, this is going to, you're going to have you know, an initial step just as here, but the next time around, you would actually take a slightly smaller step in the vertical direction and a slightly greater step in the horizontal direction. And then the next time around, you take an even smaller step in the vertical direction and a larger step in the horizontal direction and eventually get to the minimum really fast, right? So this is the basic momentum method. But then it turns out there's an even more uh, optimal way of doing it. I'll skip the pseudocode, take a look. So here's what the momentum method did. At any iteration, let's say this is the current step, then you computed the derivative at the current step, and then you computed the step which is against the derivative at the current step, right? And, and so, uh, the sum of these two, wait, then you add, wait. First compute the gradient. Okay, so let's say this was the previous step, okay? I'm sorry. So the red, the red line shows you the step that you've taken currently. And so you're currently at this dot. So you're computing the derivative and you're taking this, computing the step against the derivative. That's the blue line. To this, you add a scaled version of the red line, right? And that's going to give you the new position. And that's where you're going to take the new step, right? Then at that point again, uh, so what we did was we first computed the derivative and then you added to it a scaled version of the previous step and that gave you your final step. And you'd repeat the same process over here. Now we'd compute the derivative here, add to that, a scaled version of the previous step and take the step there. Now, look at the order. At the current location, you computed the derivative and then to that, you added a scaled version of the previous derivative. That gave you the final step. I can change the order of the operations. Instead, what I can do is, I can just take a step which is, a, which is equal, equivalent to the scaled version of the previous step and then compute the derivative and then take a step against that derivative. And that's going to give me my new step. So this is still the same operation, I just changed the order, okay? 
And this gives us what is called Nesterov's accelerated gradient. And it turns out that this is actually far more optimal than the basic momentum method itself. It will get you there faster. So here is a little comparison of uh, the two from Hinton. If you were doing gradient descent, if your previous step was this guy, then what uh, <coughs> momentum would do is to compute the anti-gradient step, which is this little arrow, and then add in a scaled version of the previous step, which is going to take you to this new blue location. Whereas if you were doing Nesterov's method, you would continue along this direction for a little while and then take a step against the gradient. And that's going to get you to this green point. And so you can see it gets you to the optimum faster. I will stop here, but all of these methods basically uh, have the idea that if you just use a common step for every direction, learning rate for every component, what is good for one component can be bad for the other. You want to have independent learning rates. But then it's hard to know what is optimal for every component, right? So you just track the behavior. And based on the behavior, if you have oscillatory behavior, you decrease the steps. If you have consistent behavior, increase the steps, you'll get there faster. We'll continue in the next class. OK, guys, just a note. I'm going to Korea, so the next class is going to be on Zoom. Everybody will be on Zoom. Next week, both lectures will be on Zoom unless I have a disaster and my laptop or my network don't work, in which case I have two instructors, standby instructors. Samiran is going to be doing the lecture on Monday if I cannot do it, and Samrudhi will do it on Wednesday if I cannot do it.